Here's 800 pounds we raised while you were in prison. No. It'll keep you going until you begin to work again. Richard! <laughs> <laughs> oh, darling Oscar. How do you like your new name? Almost as much as I loathe the old one. Ah, letters. <laughs> and look! No exiled fairy's trousseau is complete without a signed portrait of the great widow herself. You must dance naked before it at the Jubilee next month. It's from him. Oscar? I may as well tell you both now that I fully intend to effect a reconciliation with my wife, if she will have me. And rest assured, I shall never see Lord Alfred Douglas again. That part of my life is behind me. And that's a clip from The Happy Prince, and I'm delighted to say that we've been joined by its writer, director, and star, who is Rupert Everett. Hello, Rupert. How are you? Hello. Very well. How are you? I'm terrific. When you walked into the studio, having just seen your film a couple of days ago, I would have walked past you in the street and not known that it was you. Well, that's because I've got this black beard for the job I'm doing. I'm appearing currently in The Name of the Rose, a series about that, so I'm playing a monk. I've gone from Oscar Wilde to a monk. Well, and, and also, you, you, there's that plus the extraordinary amount of prosthetics that you're wearing. I didn't wear any prosthetics. Oh, OK, so, tell, so first of all, so The Happy Prince, before we get into that, explain the idea behind this is the uh, last couple of years of Oscar Wilde's life. Just explain the story that you tell in, uh, in your film. Oh, the story of my film is the story of Oscar Wilde in exile. Uh, more precisely, it's really a deathbed uh, picture. Not to put any listeners off, but it takes place uh, in the last two weeks of Oscar Wilde's life after he's had um, his fatal operation for an ear abscess, which starts destroying his brain. And and, um, it's really a story of him and his final reminiscences of his life and, um, and his kind of putting everything in perspective for himself. And The Happy Prince because? The Happy Prince because... uh, he, I wanted to weave in some kind of story between his own children and then the surrogate family he kind of created in exile. And um, I thought he was a great storyteller in exile and he uh, amused endless street urchins and petty thieves uh, with, you know, invented stories. And I thought well, it was an ideal opportunity to use The Happy Prince, which was really my initiation into Wild. Um, my mother read me The Happy Prince when I was... I should think about six or seven, and it is a great memory for me. So um, I was keen to put it in. We're used to uh, actors and directors telling us how long movies have taken (laughs) from inception to actually making it onto the screen. This this one does seem particularly long and and torturous. Why (laughs) why did it take quite such a long time, do you think? Um, It took a long, long time because I suppose I came up with it when I was a little bit past my sell-by date. So... um, it wasn't, you know, if I'd come up with it five years earlier, I could have probably made it in two weeks. But I, I came up with it when my own career had kind of fizzled out quite dramatically. And uh, just basically, as they say, no one was particularly keen to get into the Rupert Everett business at that point. So it was very, very difficult uh, to get together. First of all, I mean, it started off very well, actually. I, I wrote it. My producer, Robert Fox, sent it to Scott Rudin, who is, uh, in, my, producer, yes. in my mind, the greatest producer, really, in the world, who does fantastic commercial films, American, European. He loved it. He rang back the next day and said, I want to do it. Wow. And I was, like, walking on air. I was <laughs> making Oscar speeches in the mirror, all that kind of stuff. And then the next day, he rang back and said, yes, I, w- I really want to do it, but I forgot to tell you, I don't want you to play Oscar Wilde. You're too useless. I want um, Philip Seymour. never Seymore, said that. Not you're too useless, but he's quite a brusque person. He said, I want Philip Seymour Hoffman to play Oscar Wilde. I had a cadenza and screeched no, but I should have actually said yes, because it would have established me as a writer in, the, in a very... Uh, good position but I said no and I managed to rob between my my friend Robert Fox and I managed to keep Scott on board for a bit and we came up with a list of six directors and that's when I really first learned what it was like to be on the other side of the mirror trying to scale the walls of the great agencies uh, to get to a director it's so complicated and unless you are somebody important you really can't get in. The agents are like, they're impenetrable. Mm. And it took me, I think, three years to get no from six different directors. And at that point, I was uh, obviously very depressed, three years older, three years further down the tunnel from that little glimmer of light that used to be my career. And uh, I thought, 
this is just uh, not on. I'm going to try and make this movie myself. A screenplay is dead if you don't if it's not if it's not made. And I embarked on trying to direct it myself to absolutely you know resounding failure. In England, as you know, there's only three or four outlets to get the ball rolling, and they all said no. And then a friend of mine said, "Why don't you go to Germany? There's tons of money in Germany." So I went to Germany, and I managed to. My way kind of into a deal with one of um, there's about four places in Germany that have really good deals Cologne, Bavaria, and um, Berlin are three of them. And I got um, interest from Bavaria, but again, they'd say, Well, what's happening in England about your film because it's an English film? And of course, everyone smells rats very easily in this game. And the rat was smelled by the, by the Germans because there was nothing going on in England. So that all fell through. And then I was, you know, this was seven years later, my career even l more of a flickering. So you're really annoyed at this point. I'm really depressed at this point, And I don't even know who I am anymore, hardly. But I have one good idea, which is I remember reading David Hare's play The Judas Kiss when it was first done and knowing, see, re really enjoying it. So I got Robert, my producer, who, who was really wonderful to me all the way through this whole thing. Uh, to call David Hare and David we met and we he agreed that I could do it and we took it to the Hampstead Theatre Club they wanted to do it I meanwhile had written another uh, memoir that came out the same week as my play and I was kind of my old caravan was briefly lurched back onto the main road and um, and I was kind of off again and then I got two deals I got a deal with the BBC uh, here, uh, Christine Langen, and I got a deal with Lionsgate, my uh, distributors. And that was really what got the whole thing uh, moving. And then my Bavarians came on board, then Eurimage came on board, then Belgians, then Italians, and then Brexit <laughs> happened just as I was about to make the movie. <laughs> Anyway, it's but it's out and it, it. So that was the ten years, and it's a triumph, and so I'm sure you are delighting uh, in the in the in the reviews uh, and a sense of I told you so maybe. Although it's been a long time in the coming, just tell us about. Never say I told you so because it's a, that's a very dangerous uh, position okay. to take. But I'm absolutely thrilled yes. that so far it seems to be going well. Tell us about the way Oscar Wilde looks then, because we were just touched on that right at the very beginning. Because, that, like you said, this is the last couple of years of his life, and he's been in better shape before. So he's just come out of. Uh, he's just come out of prison what do we what is the Oscar Wilde that we see in this film he's Oscar Wilde the last great vagabond of the 19th century uh, sweaty overweight smelling vaguely of uh, toothless slightly uh, thinning greasy hair um, dirty clothes um, cadging drinks on the boulevard from English vicars uh, and regaling them with stories and um, he's a kind of my Wilde is a kind of clown in the traditional sense, a, a figure of tragedy and a figure of comedy, always making jokes. He was humorous right until the end of his life, really. Uh, the, the, the Panthers with whom he'd flirted as a great star um, from the other side of the mirror um, uh, who came to try and blackmail him on the, at the stage door of the Haymarket Theatre were now his cohorts, uh, his friends, uh, he, his, his old acquaintance would cross the boulevard to avoid him. And uh, English people, if they saw him in the street, would think themselves perfectly within their rights to either spit at him or have him removed from a restaurant or a, or a, or a bar. And that's how he lived his life. He kind of dodged bullets and uh, catched people for drinks and had a small allowance. Occasionally he was penniless, but normally he was just about okay. He was quite often moved from one hotel to another because probably he'd made some kind of disturbance. Uh, big on absinthe, uh, lush, mm. fabulous, you know, mess, basically. Was he, creatively, was he a spent force by this time? He was a spent force. He said, uh, one of his great things he said, uh, which I had in the film, but I had to cut it out, uh, I wrote when I knew nothing of life. Now that I know it, there's nothing left to write. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, and this is typical, that kind of line of, his great attitude uh, um, in exile and in defeat, uh, he, he still was fascinating. And what he wasn't was a victim also. He kind of charged on through this. He created his own constitution, his own world. Um, and yes, it was tragic. And yes, he was angry. But at the same time, he also had uh, moments of happiness, I think. In my film, I have a scene with with uh, he's with a young man he's just had sex with and he says I don't think I've ever been happier in my life in this room in this place 
And I think my feeling is that those kind of things happened. We, we see him... Uh, there's not a lot of prison uh, in this, but as you say, this is after prison. But we do see him being spat at uh, on a uh, on a railway station with an indifferent guard and a very hostile crowd. Was it was it prison that did for him, or would he have self destructed anyway? Do you think? I think what did for him really was his own snobbery in a way. I think the moment he came to England, it's written, someone wrote about him when he arrived in Oxford. He arrived in Oxford with an Irish accent within. 18 days that had gone and the new wild was kind of in embryo had been created and it was an English character and you have to understand I think wild from the 19th century perspective the Irish were as foreign to the English as the Poles and also but worse I mean you know to the English the Irish were not to be reckoned with really and so him becoming so English and then meeting an English aristocrat. This was a disaster for him because it was really, I think the great love story was an act of snobbery, really. He felt that once he'd got in with this aristocratic family, once he was talking to a marchioness about how her son was going off the rails, once he was talking to an heir, he was suddenly right in. Uh, he was a, a great arriviste in a way. You know, he was in with the royal family. He was the centre of London society. And this was really the trouble, this snobbery. So that when the Marquis of Queensbury sent him this card saying to Oscar Wilde posing as a sodomite, instead of tearing the card up, because he was one at this point, and he'd been living a very dangerous double life, he took the Marquis of Queensbury to court and sued him for, uh, for libel. This was the disaster, this snobbery. When you, when you were writing this, was it a delight to write or was there a pressure on uh, making almost everything that Oscar Wilde said a bon mot or a clever aphorism. Did that just happen? Was that an easy role for you? Or did you think, I've got to make him funny. I've got to make him sophisticated all the time. I think he's got to be, I did think he had to be funny. But also, you know, he's a very inconsistent writer. Some of his writing is not very good. Uh, and some of it's really overdone. So that part was very easy to do the <laughs> overdone stuff. And then, you know, one had to work quite hard at the very clever... Uh, witticisms and and then uh, obviously there's just a lot of um, ordinary conversation so uh, no it was a great pleasure to write I thought. How much did you enjoy singing The Boy I Love Is Up in the Gallery if that's the right title? Um, yes it is the right title. This is I, where we see you standing on a standing I on didn't a... enjoy it at all because that was a very stressful day in my uh, in, in, in my filming actually because, because you're standing on a table and you're performing this song and the appearance for everyone else is that you're having an absolute blast. Yeah what is actually happening behind the scenes <laughs> is the people who are bringing the extras from a town called Coburg uh, in Franconia which is about 40 miles away had decided that if they didn't leave in half an hour they were going to drive off without the extras so the producers were saying you've got to stop this uh, scene the, these extras have got to get undressed now and get on the bus because the bus drivers are refusing to leave so I said pay the bus drivers some extra money tell them to stay and then the oh, boy I love and then we do one take and there's no oh, sorry they've and the producers say they've got to go now um, and okay. so this is the kind of thing now that I'm was stressed <laughs> yes it was very stressful uh, I enjoyed the film uh, enormously and then um Obviously, as you said, it's the last two years of, uh, of his life. And then at the end of the film, there's a text card which comes up uh, at the end, making the point that Wilde, along with 50,000 other gay men, only got a posthumous pardon last year. Mm. And it kind of, all of a sudden, in, in, instead of it being a period drama from another world, it actually becomes part of this world and part of current life now. Mm. And also, uh, it just it, it's, it's the last exhibit of the, you know, um, hypocrisy of the English, really, the, the idea of pardoning him is absolutely re repellent to me because uh, p pardoning infers a criminal act anyway. And uh, I thought we'd got to a point where we decided that being a homosexual was not a criminal act. So this pardon is completely and utterly uh, out of place. Uh, an apology is what is uh, needed, really, for these people. I mean, I was making a documentary last year uh, about the 50 years of uh, gay legality and the stories that I came across of people who had been imprisoned or uh, under the Gross Indecency Act. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely appalling. You mentioned at the start of our conversation that you're a monk uh, in the name of the Rose. Uh, how, having, 
had what I think will be obviously a lot of success with this film and having written and directed and and starred and now your career is clearly back on track you know and you're you're back again Briefly. you're hot you know you're hot <laughs> so do you, is the writing and directing something that we're going to see you do more of I would love to on the other hand I'm a realist I I'm I, this might be a one off uh, I might be too old I might have no you know emotional brake pads to take me through another experience um and I have I it has made me dream again of new horizons. But um, I don't know. I'm aware that, you know, uh, we're in a, such a, a world that changes and is so new. And I, I'm out of kilter with it, definitely. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a good thing. Uh, but uh, I, I would love to keep going. Uh, I would love to keep engaged with my business anyway, mainly. Um, what, I, uh, what I would hope might happen is that I could get at least some decent roles again uh, in work and my dream is to you know do one of the endless projects I've been plotting ever since. Uh, Rupert Everett a pleasure to have you on the show thank you so much. Thank you very much.